This is the final resting place of some of the most influential men and women of the 19th century. Tucked away amongst these memorials to the great and the good are the graves of three largely forgotten pioneers. Baron Headley, Marmaduke Pickthall, and in an unmarked grave, William Henry Quilliam. Although few recognize their names today, in the 19th century, these men were responsible for a religious revolution that shook the British public to its core. They were aristocratic Christians who made a choice which inflamed Victorian society. They converted to Islam. An Englishman, a pucker Englishman, doesn't go native. He doesn't leave the English white, upper middle class. And they changed the face of the Muslim faith in Britain. Pitfall's great achievement was to translate the Quran. It has been perhaps the most important translation of the Quran into English that there ever has been. This is the story of three extraordinary men who embraced Islam at a time when to be a Muslim was to be seen as a traitor to your country and the focus of hostility. In the press, he was charged with treason and he certainly was put under surveillance. I think to rebel against his parents and to change his religion, I think it did break his mother's heart. Through the personal journeys of still surviving relatives, we'll discover just what these men achieved and how their legacy lives on today. My impression of Islam sat within post 9-11 thinking and the emphasis around fanaticism. But finding out about Marmaduke changed all that. Suddenly, Islam became so much more. So just what did these Victorian pioneers do to make Islam more acceptable to a society that condemned it? And are there any lessons for British Muslims today? Liverpool. Today it's home to nearly 25,000 Muslims. This is the city's largest mosque. Built in 1965, it would appear that this Muslim community is relatively new to the city. But far from it. A century ago, Liverpool was a flourishing port and Muslim sailors from India and the Far East would have been regular visitors. In fact, just three miles from today's thriving mosque, there are traces of an entire hidden history of Islam in Britain. Echoes of a community that faced many of the same problems as Muslims today, and which may hold some of the solutions. This rather faded terraced house in a Liverpool suburb is where this forgotten story of Islam begins. Although it doesn't look much now, in the 19th century, this was the first mosque in England. In 1889, the house was bought by a man named Abdullah Henry Quilliam. Quilliam was a Victorian gentleman, but he was also a Muslim convert a religious innovator who fought to change preconceptions of Islam at a time when society found it frightening and alien. And it was here that he set about doing it. Abdullah Quilliam had an architect appointed who designed the extension to the building. Ghalib Khan is the chairman of the Abdullah Quilliam Society. Uh, you can look at the arch designs that was uh, made. A few steps down is, is the mosque. The preaching was done from uh, that corner there where Abdullah would be standing. Against the odds, Quilliam established this not only as a mosque, but as a flourishing Muslim institute with its own printing press and an orphanage. It was the center of Islam, not just for Liverpool, but for the whole of Britain. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. 
It's an achievement that some Muslims believe holds the key to the future of British Islam. For me, Abdullah Quilliam really is a role model. He was so ahead of his times, as it were, that he is the blueprint in, in many respects for how we, we hope to, to continue in our communities. So just who was Abdullah Quilliam? And what did he do to try and shift the prejudices of a nation? William Henry Quilliam was born in 1856. He trained as a lawyer, and his religious upbringing was typical of many middle-class Victorians. Uh, he was born into a conservative Methodist family. His grandfather was a tub-thumping preacher. So we find a, a young man born into a family well-known for its devout nonconformist Christianity. But Quilliam's work as a lawyer amongst Liverpool's poor had a profound effect on him. Disease was rife, the mortality rate high, and the city was crawling with brothels. Quilliam was struck by what he saw as Christianity's failure to deal with the problems. And it led him to question his childhood beliefs. In order to understand Quilliam's view of Christianity, you have to understand that Victorian Britain was still an essentially a Christian society. So when Quilliam saw any kind of moral depravity, um, for him that was a Christian society that had lost its way. It was a trip to Morocco in 1887 that seems to have marked a decisive moment in Quilliam's religious journey. Whilst he was there, he was struck by the contrast of the Muslim way of life to that of Christian Britain. When he went to Morocco, he felt that people uh, live simple lives. Uh, they live, in his view, quite moral uh, lives. Uh, and there is uh, an environment of, uh, of solidarity, depending very little on uh, whether they are wealthy or poor. And that was something that was of uh, immense significance for him. Quilliam returned to Liverpool, and a year later he left his Christian beliefs behind and converted to Islam. But it was a highly controversial decision. Islam uh, in, the, in the 19th century was seen as a Christian heresy. And there were these ideas about uh, Islam being a violent faith. So it would have been very unusual for a person from his class background to convert at that uh, particular time. Two years later, Quilliam opened his mosque. But this public display of devotion to Islam immediately put him on a collision course with both the Christian hierarchy and the people of Liverpool. Quilliam faced hostility uh, right from the very beginning. They were attacked on a number of occasions. You get pig's heads being thrown into the mosque. They would congregate mobs outside the mosque who would start jeering. It raised hackles, there's no doubt about that. In the face of such opposition, the mosque seemed to have an uneasy future. Yet within 20 years, Quilliam had nearly 500 followers. He'd been made the official representative of Islam in Britain by the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. And he was starting to play a central role in the civic life of Liverpool. So how exactly did he achieve this extraordinary transformation? Quilliam's genius was to analyze why Victorians despised Islam and begin to address their prejudice. And the best sources for studying exactly how he did this are his regular publications. They include a newspaper for Muslims called The Crescent, which gives an insight into how Quilliam increased Islam's credibility through lectures at the mosque. I think it's interesting to look at the topics of these lectures because you might expect them to be religious and promoting Islam and from the Quran or whatever. But what we find is a lecture which says, with experiments um, by Professor Nuhuddin Stevens, 
a science lecture, Sugar and Saccharines, by Professor Samuel Kleeman, PhD. Quilliam knew that one of the key criticisms against Islam was that it was narrow-minded. It didn't embrace the new scientific discoveries of the 19th century. These lectures met such criticisms head on. So, so he's presenting Islam in a very rational way that's going to appeal, in, in a sense, to the new scientific consciousness um, of Victorian Britain. These events drew converts, and as numbers grew, so did Quilliam's profile. It wasn't long before the mosque was attracting important guests from abroad. In 1897, Queen Victoria held celebrations for her Diamond Jubilee. One of the visitors was a general from the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. But he didn't just visit the Queen, he also made his way to Quilliam's Mosque. It was recorded in the Crescent. Here is the main feature article of this particular edition. And I just love this, you know, I mean, here we are in the centre of Liverpool at Lime Street Station and there's all these Muslim converts with their fares and their flags, you know, receiving this very powerful figure. Such visits impressed the locals and gave Muslims the sense of being an important part of city life. And in the mosque, as converts straddled the social divides and clerks rubbed shoulders with explorers, it seemed that Islam was no longer an alien faith practiced only by foreign sailors. Quilliam's high-profile guests, his lectures, and the type of converts they drew seemed to have achieved the impossible. Islam was starting to be integrated into British society. But just as Quilliam was at the height of his success, everything changed. In June 1908, he and his eldest son left on what was supposed to be a six-week trip to Istanbul. No one knows exactly why, but without any warning, they mysteriously disappeared. After some months, his youngest son, who stays behind, begins to dismantle everything that Abdullah Quilliam had created. The properties are sold. Um, and effectively the Liverpool Muslim community comes to an end. With the disintegration of Quilliam's Mosque, the outlook for Islam in Britain appeared uncertain. But with Quilliam's departure, Muslim life found a new focus in Surrey. In 1889, a mosque had been founded here at Woking as a place for Indian students to study and worship. And it soon became the headquarters for two new converts whose mission was to continue to challenge British intolerance of Islam. The first was a feather in Islam's cap, one of the highest ranking members of the British aristocracy. Baron Headley, uh, was an Irish peer. He was born in 1855. Uh, he pursued a career in civil engineering. He spent a great deal of time in India, and that's where he came into contact with Islam. In 1913, Lord Headley converted and began to attend Woking Mosque. Extraordinary film from the time shows Edwardian ladies alongside Muslims from all walks of life. And it was this unusual combination of genteel English culture mixed with Islamic values that Headley capitalized on to try and dismantle hostile British stereotypes of Islam. So, for example, Lord Headley was involved in uh, activities such as at homes. All sorts of people uh, would gather and there uh, have tea and cakes. They mingled knowledge of Islam with cultural activities and there would be uh, renditions on the sitar, um, English ladies uh, um, playing the piano. By introducing Islam in a context familiar to Edwardian high society, Headley made the religion seem less alien, more English. They needed to be creative 
and innovative in their approach so that uh, Islam became very much part of this environment. So one could actually feel quite comfortable with uh, uh, Islam if, uh, if that's what it meant. Headley's work was another step towards breaking down British prejudice against the Muslim faith. But tea parties went only so far. It was the work of yet another Woking convert which has perhaps had the most enduring impact on Islam in Britain. His name was Marmaduke Pickthall, and his greatest achievement was to become the first English-born Muslim to translate the Quran into English, a groundbreaking work that made Islam accessible to non-Muslims. Living on the south coast today is one of Pickthall's surviving relatives. Artist Sarah Pickthall is Marmaduke's great-great-niece. Brought up by devoutly Catholic parents, it wasn't until the death of her father that she first began to learn more about her Muslim ancestor. I knew that Marmaduke Pickthall was a relation. I didn't really know that he was a Muslim convert. But when I started to look more closely, I then suddenly unpacked the most incredible life story and a man who was both a novelist and a pioneer. It's kind of what our complicated lives are like. Sarah was so inspired by Marmaduke's story that she and a group of artists have begun to explore his life and legacy in a project called Loyal Enemy. Through painting, through film, through poetry, we're going to build a kind of kaleidoscope around Pitfall's life. And we hope that through that, there'll be certain sort of shafts of light which will connect Pickfall's life with the audience uh, looking at it today. Learning about Pickfall has overturned all that Sarah thought she knew about Islam. My impression of Islam was one that sat within post 9-11 thinking. But finding out about Marmaduke changed all that. Suddenly Islam became so much more than what the media was telling us. So just what was it about Pickthall's life that not only challenges views about Islam today, but did so a hundred years ago? He was born in 1875 and brought up in the Church of England. But as a teenager he visited the Middle East. It was an experience that changed his life. He quickly seemed to gel with the local people. Very quickly he was speaking Arabic and he speaks about the friendliness of the people. But there was a social cohesion there and it was, he believed, united by this overarching belief in Islam. I mean, he, he says uh, very significantly, he said, he said, for the first time I was happy. He was happy. But although attracted to the religion and mindset of the Orient, it wasn't until the First World War, 20 years later, that Pickthall finally rejected his childhood beliefs. Britain declared war not only against Germany, but Turkey as well, the center of the Ottoman Empire and the Muslim faith. It was a country Pickthall had visited and been impressed by. So he was shocked when he found Islamophobia being used to justify the war by British politicians and clergy. Pickthall went to church and the congregation were singing one of Charles Wesley's hymns that was quite uh, anti-Islam. It referred to the Prophet Muhammad as the imposter and the Arab thief who is disrupting the whole of Asia. And I think he was utterly distressed by it all. Pickthall left the church before the end of the service and never again considered himself a Christian. In 1914, he converted to Islam. It was a decision that ultimately transformed him from innocent traveler and novelist to an enemy of the state. After his conversion, Pickthall attempted to persuade the British government 
to change its policy towards Turkey. But his actions had devastating personal consequences. He became a total outsider in Britain, a security risk. He was a man who was supporting the enemy and who'd embraced Islam. Uh, he destroyed his reputation as a conservative Englishman. Such an atmosphere of suspicion drove Marmaduke to leave Britain altogether. He moved to India, which became his home for the next two decades. But although he was nearly 5,000 miles away, his actions would still have a huge impact on Muslims back in Britain. It was here that he undertook the most important work of his life, a pioneering translation of the Quran from Arabic to English. Published in 1930, it was seen as a milestone in the history of translation. This is an early edition of Pickthall's translation of the Quran, and the remarkable thing is that it's the first time a believing Muslim has translated the Quran, who was also a native speaker of English. He was also a, a, an accomplished writer, and he transfers all these skills to his translation of the Quran. Although there had been previous translations, they were renowned for their anti-Muslim bias. These translations came with notes at the bottom, and these notes reflected prejudices that Muhammad uh, couldn't possibly have uh, had had a revelation that much of the Quran was copied from Jewish and, and Eastern Christian sources. So when Pickthor's version of finally appeared, because the notes that, uh, that exist in that translation are the notes of a believer, and they take into account the standard authoritative commentaries on the Quran, then um, you, would be, you would be drinking from a purer source. By producing a more objective translation in a language understandable to a wider audience, Pickthall was breaking down prejudice. There has always been a suspicion of a holy book in a strange language. So he was making the Quran accessible and if there has been a kinder and more tolerant appreciation of Islam, it has been through Pickthall's translation. And there was somewhere back in Britain that particularly welcomed it. Woking Mosque, Pickthall's base before he left for India. At a time when it seemed all of Britain was against him, it was the one place he had felt at home. The mosque is somewhere that Sarah Pickthall has always wanted to see, and this is her first opportunity. I think Marmaduke would have been pleased for me to visit um, a place that was so important to him, just to see the impact he had there. I think, he'd be, I think he'd be really pleased that I was coming. Look, just in here. <laughs> Sarah, hello, wonderful Sarah. to meet you. Hello, wonderful. Khalil. Hello. <laughs> hello, good to meet you too. Your great-great uncle would have been here many times. Khalil Martin, like Pickthall, is a convert and has agreed to show Sarah around. So, here we are. This is the Shah Jahan Mosque Woking. It's a flourishing mosque at the heart of, of a, a vibrant Muslim community. And there must be at least 10,000 uh, Muslims living locally. In the here. vicinity. And yeah, when, yeah. when this was built, there wasn't one Muslim you know, living anywhere near to the mosque. Came to Very the mosque. different from yeah. Marmaduke's time, yeah. yes. isn't it? It's yeah. changed yeah. a lot. Yeah. Although Pixel only spent three years here, a century later his influence can still be felt, in a way he could never have imagined. It's interesting, I've just downloaded a, a Quran application for my iPhone, and uh, the English translation that's offered for the, uh, for the Quran app is Marmaduke Pixels. Mm. Yeah. 
It's great. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, that feels legacy, contemporary. Yeah, you know, his legacy is living it feels on. Feels you know, contemporary. Yeah. yeah, that's great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that you know? Do you feel that being here? And for Sarah, there's one more stop. And this is Professor the Michelle library where Pickthall would have worked. Uh, here is, uh, and where some of today's members of Woking Mosque are keen to meet Marmaduke Pickthall's great great niece. <laughs> and to talk to her about their experience of his Quran. This translation yeah. is by your, your great uncle. So, <coughs> uh, beginning with um, verse 18, uh, Mary said, Lo, I seek refuge in the beneficent one from thee, if thou art God fearing. Angel Gabriel then replied, I am only a messenger of thy Lord, that I may bestow on thee a faultless son. So that is from the translation according to your great uncle. Do people find it easy as a translation? Yeah, it's a, uh, a, a little bit, some words are thou thee. A little bit, oh, yes, yeah, thou would be, yeah. yes. Yeah. There, there were a lot of these all, and thou's, yes. Otherwise, it's very yeah. it interesting. Very much so. This was the first translation that I read. Was it? Absolutely, oh. yes. Yeah. So, um, personally, it's important to me yes. as well, definitely. Yes. Pickthall, like Quilliam and Headley before him, helped to demystify Islam and his work continues to inform and encourage new generations. Pickthall remained in India, but he returned to Britain at the end of his life. In 1936, he was buried just five miles from his beloved mosque. And it's rumored he chose this spot for a reason because he wanted his final resting place to be near the unmarked grave of someone he'd been close to at Woking. A man known as Henri de Lyon. Henri de Lyon was a quiet man, had clearly traveled, had a very strong allegiance to the Ottoman Empire, but a very respected member of the Woking community. But Henri was not all that he seemed. He was none other than Abdullah Quilliam. Like Pickthall, he too found his faith put him at odds with British foreign policy. And after his mysterious departure from Liverpool, many believe he wanted to maintain a lower profile. So when he returned to England, he took a different name and lived out the rest of his life quietly at Woking. William died in 1932, Baron Headley, three years later. Although these men lived a century ago, they faced many of the same challenges as contemporary Muslims. And some believe the way they tried to tackle the prejudice towards Islam then offers ways forward for Muslims in Britain today. Generally, there is a disquiet today about Muslims demanding a special treatment. What we learn from these converts is that uh, it doesn't have to be so at all. They were trying to develop as much integration with society as possible. Quilliam had a realization that if you were going to promote Islam in Britain, it had to be British. It's an approach that even now is transforming views. I think from that first time I learned more about him, I've changed very much in how I feel about Islam. From the two-dimensional view, it's become multifaceted, and I feel that the impact of his life has so much to teach us to expand our thinking. Um, I, I feel we're just at the start of that in this country, and it feels incredibly exciting to be part of that journey. <laughs>